Before we get back into our look in Hebrews, please again join me in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, you are the author of the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. It is breathed out by you. It is kept by you. It is inerrant and it is perfect and completely uh, self-sufficient and all-sufficient because that's who you are. You are perfect. You are inerrant and you are all-sufficient. And so it makes sense that your word is all those things too. As we study your word tonight and every time we open your word, may you help us through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit to gain a greater wisdom and understanding of what your word says. Help us find your authorial intent and find the one true interpretation so that we are rightly handling your word every time we get into it. Be with us and bless us as we spend time in your word for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 10 is just the quickest of refreshers. All of Hebrews has been talking about how Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than Abraham. Jesus is greater than Aaron and the priesthood. Jesus is greater than angels. Jesus is greater. And the idea is that the writer of Hebrews is really making that point to Hebrews and to other believers too, that Jesus is greater, so he is uh, abrogating everything that came before him. He is um, what everything that came before him was pointing to. And now that he's there, now that he has come, now that he has lived his perfect life, died on the cross and rose again to be at the right hand of the Father, he is greater. He is the new way, the new covenant. And so this continues along that path. And you have to remember, we're in Hebrews 10 now. And so all of Hebrews 1 through 9 has been pounding that point. Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is greater. He is the creator, not the created. He is the Son of God. He is greater. And if He is who He says that He is, we should listen to Him, has been the point. And you have to remember that this is written mostly towards Hebrews who had the old Levitical system. And so you have this tough charge of having to explain to them and answer their questions and lead them from the old covenant into the new covenant. And that's what all of Hebrews has been doing. And now we have kind of a shift where it starts to discuss, if so this, then that. If Jesus is greater and everything that's been said up to this point is true, then blank. And this is the point we're at now. He said he's going to be talking to brethren. He's going to be addressing his Jewish brethren with an invitation to come out of the old covenant and come into the new covenant. And we talked before about how the old covenant was not perfect, which is why it had to be uh, sacrifices had to be done again and again and again and again in the old covenant because they weren't perfect. But Jesus, who is the great high priest of the new covenant, is the once and for all perfect sacrifice, therefore only needing to be done once, once and for all, accomplishing his work, and then sitting down, no longer needing to do that work at the right hand of the Father. Whereas the old Levitical priests, they had to always stand up, they always had to go in, they always had to do these sacrifices. Not so with Jesus, because he's greater. So this is, a, this is the, this is the follow-up to... If that stuff is true, this should be your response to it. That's what the writer is saying here. A full assurance of faith. Verse 19. Therefore, brothers. And that therefore is important. It means everything that's been set up to this point. Because of that, then this, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way he opened for us through the curtain, That is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God. This is just summarizing what Jesus did for his people. Therefore, because we have the confidence to enter the holy places, something that only the high priest could do. In the old system, only the high priest could enter the holy of holies and only do that once a year. Jesus has replaced that old system. And now we, we, I'm no high priest, you're no high priest, but now we can have a confidence to enter that same holy place. Why? By the blood of Jesus and by the new and living way that he opened for us. You didn't do it, I didn't do it, he did it for us. By the opening of through the curtain that is through his flesh, since we have such a great high priest over the house of God. 
This is uh, have boldness. I have boldness in coming into the, the Holy of Holies, so to speak. Not because of myself, but because of what Jesus has done. That's an important note. That's important to note because now I know that I can run to God and go to the Holy of Holies, so to speak, without any kind of trepidation because of what Jesus has done. So when I sin and I need to go to God and ask for forgiveness, I can run straight to him. I don't have to go to a priest. I don't have to do anything else. I can go straight to him. I have access to a bold approach to God, not because of me. It has nothing to do with me, does it? We just read that in verses 19 and 20. It's because of Jesus. So he gets all the glory. He gets all the praise. He's the reason why we can have a bold approach to God and take advantage of this access with boldness. Boldness. I don't have to be uh, shying away because if I shy away, and go, well, I don't know if I can approach or not. I'm, if I do that, what I'm really doing is saying, I don't trust what, what Jesus did was enough. Do you see? But if I do trust what Jesus did was enough, I can go boldly because Jesus tells me I can go boldly. That's the idea. And the boldness is not, I can walk into the throne room of God and I can ask him anything I want and he's going to give it to me like some great genie. That is not what this boldness is talking about. The boldness is, is that you can come before God in a way that people in the old covenant would be jealous of. They couldn't come close to God like that. When the, great high, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, they'd tie a rope around him when he'd go in there. In case he died in, in God's presence, they'd pull the body out with a rope. He had to cleanse himself before he could go into the Holy of Holies to offer the once a year sacrifice, which had to be done every time, every year, over and over and over again. Jesus Christ is greater than the high priest. He's greater than any priest of Aaron's family because he himself never had to cleanse himself before going into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. He himself was the perfect sacrifice that only had to be sacrificed once. He was completely without blemish, perfect, sinless, the perfect sacrifice. And his sacrifice was accepted by God because God raised him from the dead to prove that he was pleased with what he did. If Jesus was a liar, if Jesus' sacrifice was all for naught, God would not have raised him from the dead. So this is like getting the stamp of approval. So you can say that what Jesus did and said was 100% perfect and greater, and it is final. There's no next new covenant. There's only one new covenant, and this is it. Jesus took care of it. So now because of that, we can enter boldly into the presence of God, something that could not have been done before Jesus did that. Now we do it boldly with a confidence because of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice. Now we can enter into the presence of God. Put yourself in the Wayback Machine and pretend you go back into the time of this writing and you're a Hebrew and you're used to hearing about how the high priests and the priests and the sacrificial Levitical system and all those things that you had to do, and you think, boy, it would be pretty cool to be able to go into the Holy of Holies just once, to go into the presence of God just once. Oh, that would be so neat, right? Terrifying because, hey, it's the presence of God, but also kind of neat. I wish I could do that. And then imagine being told one day you'll be able to be in the presence of God because of what Christ will do. And not only that, you're going to be indwelt with God himself, the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine? Like, they would be like, wait, what? How? I'm filthy. I am unclean. How can that be done? It can be done with confidence and boldness because of what Christ did. Because of who Christ is and what he did on behalf of those who he saves. If you entered as the Old Testament high priest did with the blood of animals, you couldn't have boldness. It's the blood of Jesus that provides a new and living way that he consecrates us with. You're covered in his righteousness. That's why there's a blessed assurance. If you have genuine faith in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and you're genuinely saved, you are clothed, you are covered, uh, coated, so to speak, in Jesus's righteousness. You have 100% confidence and boldness that you're going to heaven and that is not because of you and your work it's because of christ and his work that's why it's so glorious that's why it's like look when i tell you this new covenant you won't want the old one 
Because the new covenant is so much better. This is a, a total contrast in the new covenant from the old covenant. The high priest, when he would go into the Holy of Holies, he would, he would be trembling because if he neglected the smallest item that was prescribed by the law, he's dead. He's dead. That's why they put a rope around him and pull him out. How terrifying. And if it was up to us, we would have the same terror when we approach God too. The difference maker is Jesus Christ. That's the difference. Because Jesus' work was perfect. And so therefore, faith in him and his work gives us or clothes us in his righteousness. He takes upon himself our sins. He gives us his righteousness. So there's no, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it to heaven. I think I've done enough good things. Rubbish. Rubbish. That is not the gospel. The gospel is, is you have faith in Jesus Christ. He has done everything that needs to be done because he is our great high priest. He has made the sacrifice, which was himself the perfect sacrifice. And he accomplished his everything. So take confidence when you read scripture like this. It's meant to embolden you. It's meant to make sure that you have no fear. Why A believer has no fear in death. No fear in death. Because you're not going before God on your own merit. You're going before God and he will see you through the merit of Jesus Christ that is clothing you in his righteousness. That's why there's no fear. If I had to go in there on my own merit, you better believe I would have a reason to fear and so would you. But this is the new covenant. That's not the case. We go on Jesus. Genuine believers come to the throne of God with confidence because of Jesus' meritorious blood that was shed on our behalf, the great atonement that he did once and for all, we are now justified and at peace with God thanks to Christ and what he's done. And now we have special boldness to enter. It's, uh, that implies it's present. It doesn't mean you will have, it's you have. You see the difference? Uh, you will have a boldness to enter. No, that means it's waiting and it's, it's going to happen. No, no, this is you have. You can do it now. You can boldly enter now. And when you do, you see that this is why Jesus is the core of everything in Christianity. When I come to God in prayer, I can come to him boldly and I can do so without fear and trembling because of Jesus Christ, which makes me grateful and thankful for Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done, because I recognize who I am and what I've done. And so it, and now I recognize his great love for me, which makes me love him even more and makes me want to serve him. Not out of some kind of dread, but out of love and gratefulness for what he has done for me as he continues to show me the great things he has done for me. It makes the sacrifice of Jesus always fresh. It's always fresh. It's a new and living way. This, the, again, I've said this before, but just to reiterate quickly, the Old Testament was meant to point to the New Testament. The Old Covenant points to the New Covenant. Testament means covenant. Old Covenant, New Covenant. And so the Old was meant to point to the New. It's like the, the, the uh, music poster, right? Uh, Winona Judd is coming to town. Winona Judd is coming to town. Winona Judd is coming to town. June 15th, June 15th. Winona Judd, Winona Judd. And then Winona Judd comes, plays the concert, and leaves, right? Those posters are no longer needed. The posters were there to tell you what was going to happen and what was coming. Winona Judd concert, right? Same thing, remember Winona Judd? So, so, I know. So, once the concerts happened, the posters are no longer needed. The old covenant pointed to Jesus Christ. Once Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came, lived, died, and rose again, the old covenant was no longer needed because Jesus brought with him the new covenant. Do you see? It's the same idea. That he, he brought in what the old covenant was foreshadowing, was pointing to. The imperfect pointed to the perfect. And that's what Jesus did. It's a living way. You don't have access because of a dead animal. You have access because of the perfect, sacrificed, sinless Son of God. And so that's what ushers you into the throne room of God, that perfect sacrifice. You couldn't ask for a better covering. You couldn't ask for a better sacrifice. 
That's why with boldness, having boldness, having confidence, because that shows my trust in Christ. I trust Christ. I trust what he said about himself was true. I trust what he did on my behalf is true. I trust what God's word says about him. Therefore, I have no reason to do anything else but have confidence and boldness when I come to God because of my trust in who Christ is and what he's done. None of that has anything to do with me. And none of this says anything about you. It doesn't say that you have to have faith and trust in Christ and that you yourself have to do X, Y, Z. No, it all is pointing towards faith in Christ and his work and what he has done. That's why he says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because he does all the hard work. Have you ever carried a, a, heavy, a heavy couch with someone going up or down some stairs? And you know the couch weighs the same on both ends, but sometimes you get the end and it feels like it's easy and the other person is doing all the hard stuff. And you're just kind of like, la, 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 la. Oh, you got that up there? Are you okay up there? Oh, yeah, just hold on. Oh, I'm trying to twist it. Right? And you're just, la, 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 I've got it. No problems down here. Da, 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 da. Because the other person's taking all the weight. Your burden is easy. Your yoke is light. Because the other person has all the weight. Jesus has all the weight. But in a far greater sense than moving furniture. It's a new and living way through Jesus. Because he has separated the veil that used to separate the Holy of Holies from the rest. Jesus did that. To enter the Holy of Holies, you would have had to have passed through a veil, a thick veil. This isn't some thin, very, you know, see through y kind of veil. This was like a thick, fat curtain. Especially in the temple, the one that ripped when Jesus was crucified. Fat, thick. Una unable to be ripped outside of a purposeful act. You would have been separated if you were entering into the Holy of Holies in the old temple by that veil. This veil was therefore separating man from God's intimate presence. His intimate presence was in the Holy of Holies. When Jesus is crucified and dies, that veil is torn in two, representing that that is now open. That intimate presence with God in the Holy of Holies is now open to anyone that God saves. It's not just open to the high priest once a year. No, no. It's open to everyone because Jesus has made that possible. And he did that through his flesh. The writer of Hebrews makes an analogy between the veil that stood between God and man and the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus. Jesus' body was torn was destroyed right hurt killed and so was the veil indicating that now that has been destroyed through jesus's death the veil was destroyed there's no longer a separation between intimate personal relationship with god you can come to god now boldly and with confidence not because of you but because of christ which makes you glorify christ and praise him all the more because he is greater it's important to note, too, that the veil wasn't, you know, rolled up, stuck in the back corner just in case it's ever needed again. No, it was rent in two, destroyed, never to be put up again. That's an important note. Why? Because having a high priest over the house of God, we have a great high priest now over the house of God. Remember, we said Jesus is greater. He's a greater high priest than any other high priest. He's the great high priest. He's the great high priest because he does his service once. He makes his sacrifice once. And when he makes his sacrifice and when he is in, the, in his priestly role, it's in the house of God up in heaven. He's not in some man-made tent or man-made structure. He's in the house of God itself. He presides over the heavenly courts. He's therefore there in the very place to make sure that we have access which again, which is why you can come boldly and with confidence. Do you see how this whole message glorifies Christ? Like you get the benefit of being able to greatly and um, boldly go before God's throne. You get the benefit, but God gets the glory. Christ gets the glory. Christ gets the praise. That's always a good litmus test. Who's being glorified here? Is it man or is it God? Is it man or is it Christ? It should always be 
God. It should always be Christ. Verse 22. In light of what Jesus has done then, let's draw near to God. Kind of like the therefore moment again. Therefore, in light of what Jesus has done, we should draw near to God. God has made it possible for us to draw near to him. We should do that, right? Verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let me drive that point home again. In light of what Jesus has done, we should draw near. What Jesus has done is what the writer just got done saying. Tore the veil in two. Intimate, personal relationship with God is now possible. You can now come boldly with confidence before his throne. That is that is unreal. And now that that's possible, you should take advantage of that and do that. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. With that perfect cleansing available to us, described in terms of this new covenant, your heart sprinkled, and the Christian practice of baptism, bodies washed, we can draw near to God in a way never available to someone under the old covenant. The work of Jesus makes us able to draw near with a full assurance of faith. Not a kind of, sort of, assurance of faith. A full assurance of faith. This is one of those truths in Scripture that when you understand it, it is life-changing. Because there's a difference between a full assurance of faith and a partial. You've probably met Christians who have a partial, uh, a partial type of assurance of faith. And you can tell them apart from those who have a full one, can't you? If you ever meet someone with a full assurance of faith, uh, that's a different kind of animal. That's a different kind of person. What do they fear? You're going to kill me? Send me to my Lord? Cancer's going to take my life? May God be glorified. Father, help me to, to glorify you and to point others towards Christ in the short time that I have left. But I have all eternity with you because of what Christ has done. You have a full assurance of faith? And again, the full assurance of faith, as opposed to a partial assurance of faith, is simply this, understanding that, that your faith is not about you as much as it's about Christ. It's not how tightly you hang on to Christ, it's how tightly Christ is hanging on to you. So you can have a full assurance of faith. There is no, there's no room for doubt. You don't need to have doubt. How, why should I doubt what Christ has done for me? Christ is all-powerful. He is the creator, not created. He is the perfect sacrifice, the great high priest. He is the perfect mediator. He has done everything that was required to make peace between me and God. And he's given me his perfect life of righteousness to wear. So I know I'll be able to go into heaven. I have no doubt. There's zero doubt because I don't doubt Christ. I know Christ is perfect. I know I'm not. But it's not about my work. It's about the work of Christ. So when you understand that, you can have a full assurance of faith that, hey, it's, it's not about me. It's about my faith in Christ and who he is and what he's done for me. So big difference. It's understanding the true work of Jesus, which makes you able to draw near to him with full assurance of faith. Bodies washed. The thing that distinguished Christian baptism from the multiple different illustrations that were practiced in different religions of the ancient world was that it was more than an outward cleansing of the body from a ritual defilement. Christian baptism is the outward sign of an inward cleansing. That was unique in Christian baptism. All other religions that had some kind of cleansing or washing it was only external. Christian baptism says, no, we are washed clean from the inside out. Something done by Christ as well. Hearts sprinkled, bodies washed. These are not conditions of approach to be able to come to God, but conditions that are already possessed. My heart sprinkled, my body washed. That is not something you have to do before you go to God. It's something that's already been done for you through your faith in Christ. And because of all this, I have no reason not to draw near. Let us then draw near. All the issues that need to be settled are settled. 
I can come before God now because of the greatness of Christ. And I have no reason to doubt him. So therefore, everything's settled. I can draw near to him. So let me do so. Let me draw near to him. The problem of access to God has been settled forever. The problem of a perfect high priest has been settled. The problem of my sin and the pollution of the sin and within my, has been settled. This is an encouragement to draw near. And it's given because it's necessary. It goes against the way we feel, right? Th think about it. it. It goes against the way we feel. These discouraged Christians had a problem with drawing near. And sometimes we have the same problem. Not, not drawing near to the intimate relationship with Jesus. Not drawing near to the intimate relationship with God. We can have that same problem sometimes. What this is telling me is that I can go to God boldly. So even when I sin, I don't run away from God, I run to God. I don't run away from God, I run to God. I don't Remember how I talked about the penalty box a little while ago? And I said, look, some people make that mistake where they think they sin as a Christian and you're going to still sin until you get to heaven. The good work that he has begun, he will finish, but he doesn't finish it until you get to heaven. And so you are at the same time sinner and saint now. So when we sin, sometimes we get that tendency to say, I've sinned, I can't go to God. I need to put myself in some sort of imaginary penalty box. And, you know, after a day of feeling bad for myself and grieving over all this stuff, maybe I'll, maybe I'll pray to God about it, maybe I'll go to Him, maybe it'll take a week, maybe it'll take, just depends, right? That is completely rubbish. <laughs> That's completely rubbish. Especially when we read this in Hebrews 10, yes? I have full confidence God knows I'm a sinner. That's why he sent Jesus Christ to die. If anyone could do it on their own, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. Jesus wouldn't have had to live the perfect life we couldn't live. So what's keeping me from going to the Lord in boldness, even right after I sin? That's exactly what I should do. I should go closer to him. The prodigal son should have went right back to the dad immediately. Right? Right? When he finally does, what's he find? Forgiveness, grace, mercy. Unparalleled, unbelievable. What should we do? Same thing. No reason to wait, no reason to be in the penalty box and be like, well, what good is that doing? Well, you know, it's just our own comfort. I feel bad, I feel awful, I feel dirty, I feel like I shouldn't go near him, da 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 da. But what Christ has done allows us to draw near in spite of ourselves. And what you're really doing when you do that is glorifying Christ. What you're really doing when you run to the Father, even right after you sin, you run to the Father and you say, I am so grieved over my sin, I have failed you again. I love you, but at the same time I feel like a hypocrite because I say I love you and then I do the very thing that I know you do not want me to do. And uh, every fiber of my being wants to run from you, but I know better. I know that what you have done through Christ has saved me in spite of myself. And so I run to you now. As dirty as I am, I run to you now because I know and believe what Christ has done on my behalf. Do you see how that glorifies Christ? Do you see how that glorifies God? That's what this means. Draw near. Come close. Draw near. The people that are being written to here might have thought that they had problems, persecution, difficult relationships, relationships, hard times with uh, culture. But the real problem was their relationship with God wasn't on track. They didn't draw near to God on the basis of what Jesus has done. And that's what we're being encouraged to do here. This letter is not just to Hebrews. This is to believers today. Like I can draw near to God because of what Jesus has done, not because of my track record. My track record is trash. All I do is sin. <laughs> the very thing, Romans 7, Paul, the very thing I don't want to do is the very thing I do. He, he laments that Christian lament of sin and grief over sin. That's one of the ways you know that you're genuinely saved. You grieve over your sin. You have a different type of holy grief that, re that produces repentance. You grieve over your sin. You hate your sin. Whereas once before, you didn't care. You just... Wanted to sin because you liked how it felt. Once you're saved, you care. 
And now you understand that you can draw near to him, not because of what you have done, but because of what Jesus has done. So now there's no reason not to go to him immediately, in every circumstance, with confidence and boldness. And that confidence and boldness is not confidence and boldness in you or in me. It's confidence and boldness in Christ, which allows us to draw near. This is the, the heart of the invitation to Christ as an unbeliever to become a believer. It's the heart of the invitation for believers to come to, to, come to God and come to his throne frequently and often with confidence and boldness because of Christ. It's a wonderful invitation. This, is a, this also will give you a, a security, a knowing that you are, when you immediately deal with your sin and go to the Father, and you, you go down in prayer and right away, there is a confidence that builds in your faith in spite of your failings. Because what you're really doing is showing your confidence in Christ. And that builds your confidence in the reality and the validity of your faith. Verse 23. In light of what Jesus did, let's hold fast to the truth. So in the same way that we just got done saying, therefore, or in light of, of all these things that Jesus has done, verse 23 says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Discouragement and other things can make people waver from the truth. But when you have a great confidence in the greatness of Jesus and in what he has done in the new covenant on your behalf, you will stand strong in the faith because you realize the faith is not built upon you. It's built upon Christ and what he's done for you. And he will sanctify you. He will cleanse you. He will make you more and more like himself. He will, he will do what he promises. There is three zones, right? Justification or being made right with God. Sanctification where God is setting you apart and making you more like Christ. And glorification where the work of Christ and God in you is completed and finished. You're glorified in heaven. When you go to heaven, that's the moment you're glorified. When Christ comes back, that'll be the moment when we're glorified. You're justified the moment you come to genuine faith. The moment you believe. And some people can point to that moment and other people can't. And they can say, look, it was sometime between this and this. It doesn't matter. It's when you had genuine faith, you were justified or made right with God by your faith in Jesus Christ. So justification, you know that that was a work of Jesus Christ. Glorification, you understand that's a work of Jesus Christ. Sanctification, that's the dirty work zone in the middle. It is no different than the other two. That is a work of Christ as well. God will do his work in you to sanctify you in that dirty work zone. And that will be at different paces and different approaches by God through his spirit for everyone. But he will do it. He, those he justifies, he will glorify. And those he glorifies, he has justified. And those he justifies, he will sanctify. And those he glorifies will have been sanctified. So it all is guaranteed and it's all guaranteed, not because you and I are so awesome and so great, and boy, we got this, and Jesus is just like a supplement. You shoot him up in your arm, and it's a shot of vitamin J, and now you can live the perfect life that God wanted you to. No. Everyone who's been saved for a little while understands that you still sin, sadly. And so Jesus is not some supplement that you take that now because you have him, you can do it yourself now with a little help from Jesus. No, you understand your depravity even better now. Because you realize, in spite of realizing the truth and understanding the truth, you see that you're helpless. You're helpless to live the perfect life. And so it makes you even more dependent upon Christ. That's the whole idea. That this is all dependent upon Christ. So you hold fast to the confession of hope without wavering, for God who promised is faithful. This is what makes you strong in the faith. Not you, but Christ. Let's hold fast. That should be something that, uh, that every Christian remembers. Hold fast without wavering. Don't, uh, don't stray. Don't stray. Shoot straight. Don't waver. Stay firm. 
when others are shaky around you, you stay firm, not because you're so strong and you're able to stand firm in spite of it, but because of your trust of Christ, who you know is firm and ever, ever stable, never changing. He is always faithful. He promised he will do it. God always does what he promises. The reason you can stand strong is because he who promises is faithful. So you're not even standing on your own faithfulness. Do you understand? I mean, how much greater can I... I mean, I feel like a, a salesman, right? How much greater can I make this sound? You're not even standing on your faithfulness. Neither am I. We're standing on Christ's faithfulness. I know and will not waver in my faith because I know Christ is faithful even though I'm not. Oh, don't get me wrong. I might be more faithful for this, than this person or that person, but I am not being measured by this person or that person. I'm being measured by God. Being held to his standard. And if I'm being held to his standard, I have to say, I will never match up. So I abandon that and I say, I will put all my faith and trust in Christ who is God and does match up. And because he is faithful, even when I'm not, I can have confidence. And I don't have to waver. I can hold fast. I can persevere. There is, a, there is an eternal security that I can have because of that. Not because of me, lest I be able to boast at all, but all because of Christ. Persecution might come, but God is faithful. Temptations may abound, but God is faithful to provide an escape. I can confess my hope. I can be affirmed in my salvation without wavering because everything is of Christ. And because Christ is perfect, because God is perfect and Christ is God, I have the utmost confidence. God's promises are reliable. And with that, you can persevere. No matter what you're going through, you can persevere when you have that truth. When you have that truth. Verse 24. Again, in light of what Jesus did, let's be in communion or community with the rest of God's people. Therefore, or because of what Jesus did, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Don't, don't let discouragement or hardships or difficulties make you avoid the community of the church because that's the time you need it most. And this isn't a suggestion, by the way. This is a command. All of Scripture is not suggestion. It's commands. Jesus meets us in one another. If, if Christ is within all other believers, if God's Holy Spirit is indwelling all of those believers, I should want to be around other believers. Because they're going to help stir me up to love and good works. And the love and good works, at this point, I hope I don't even have to tell you, the love and good works is not how you earn your way into heaven. Christ did that for you. That has been made amply evident here. So this is love and good works that happens as a result of Christ's salvation. It's the evidence that you have already been saved. Stir up. Uh, incite. Incite. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. How to incite one another to love and good works. How to take one another kind of like lovingly by the shoulders and stir up to love and good works. Remember what Christ has done. Remember all the promises. Do you, do you see the context here? We've talked about how Christ is greater, how he's the full assurance of faith, that he's the reason we have confidence and boldness of our salvation and of our intimate relationship with God our relationship being restored because of Christ, because of all that, draw near to him. Because of all that, you should come together as believers and stir one another, one another up to love and good works. Remind each other of these promises that we were just reading in Hebrews 10. Because this is fantastic encouragement. If somebody's down, fantastic encouragement, yes? If somebody is looking for direction in their life, fantastic encouragement. 
And when we stir up one another to love and good works, I mean, that's, that's taking all of what God's word says into account as well. Somebody has a situation, you can tell them, hey, do you know God's word says this about that particular, that particular subject? Not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near, all, all the more as the end comes closer. This is what that means. So incite one another here in a good sense. Not just sitting around, kind of twiddling thumbs, being like, boy, I don't know, nothing's happening right now. No, like actively pursuing that love and good works because of the love you have for God, because he first loved you and what he's done for you in and through the person of Jesus Christ. The love word here is agape. The agape style of love, the self-sacrificing style of love. Faith and hope and love can be practiced in solidarity, but the exercise of love in this sense can only be exercised in a community. You, this is why we stood so firm about meeting during COVID. This is why I allowed, like, I kept the, the church open the entire time, didn't I? And the whole reason for that was to make sure that people knew that there is a constant in the, in the insanity of the world and in the inconsistency of the world, there is a constant, and that is God and his word. And that is what Christ has done. And so the church will be open because that's the bride of Christ. The church takes its marching orders from God and God alone and his word. And so people had the ability. Some people came back immediately. Other people, it took a week. Other people, it took two weeks, right? But you came. You came because of this, a desire to be stirred up to love and good works and in community, a gathering, an actual physical gathering with one another. It's not church to be watching it on TV. Can you be edified by that? Absolutely. Can you share in uh, some form of, of Christian brotherhood that way? Sure, but it is not this. It is not this. This is different. So when he says consider this then, that's what we're meant to do. Respond to it. Respond to it. You're a community of believers. You're meant to gather. Uh, it's easier. You can take so many different aspects on this. 1 Corinthians 12. You're, you're all parts of the same body. So if the body is, is together when we meet, you don't want to be a nose in the field over here. Because you're doing no good for the body. You don't want to be a hand in the sand over here because you're not connected to the body, therefore you're not doing any good for the body. And the body can't do you any good either. It goes both ways. Uh, some people will say, well, I just don't feel like going to church today. I don't really need anything. Well, maybe you're not supposed to go to church today for you. Maybe you're there to encourage somebody else. That'll, that'll get you up in the morning. Right? God has called you to good works that he has preordained before the foundations of the world, Ephesians 2.10. And so perhaps that good work is getting out of bed, going to church, and even though you don't feel like it, talking to so-and-so or such-and-such and, such and giving them a little word of encouragement or just saying a little prayer with them while they're in the back room or even just a smile sometimes can change somebody's day because you don't know what they're going through. The idea is that it's a mutual encouragement. You come to be served and you come to serve. Both. We come ultimately to serve and worship Christ. That's the purpose here. It's, it's not entertainment. I took down the smoke cannons and the lights and the, all the sizzle a long time ago. Now nah, we never had that stuff. Because it's not about entertainment, right? I wonder what other churches do. I get excited when I hear somebody growing in the, in the spirit, when I hear somebody growing in their knowledge of God's word, or I see them growing in faithfulness to God and obedience and putting to death sin. That's what excites me. I don't know what excites these churches that are all about entertainment. Look, we got an extra symbol on the drum set. I don't know. What excites them? Did you see the new fog machine that came in? I don't know what excites them. But you have to, if you're not having real growth in God's spirit uh, in a church, then you have to make something up or else people will think nothing's happening there. But in a genuine church, there's this, this love and this stirring up to love and good works or good deeds. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Forsaking fellowship is a sure way to give place to discouragement. 
You're not meant to be alone. Sheep don't travel solo. We're compared to sheep. Sheep don't travel solo. Okay? That's not a thing. You know, well, I'm a solo sheep. No, no such thing. You travel in a group, right? You're shepherded as a group. That's the idea. That's the idea. There's always that story, too, that I don't know where this came from. I've heard this for years. A uh, pastor goes over to visit an, an older gentleman who has not been coming to church for a while. And so he comes, he invites him in. They sit down in front of the fireplace. And without any words, the pastor takes a coal from the fire, removes it from the center where it's surrounded by a bunch of other coals, and sets it off to the side. And within just a few moments, that coal starts and that ember starts to cool, and it stops glowing, and it gets all cold and lifeless. And the pastor takes the tongs, picks that little coal back up, puts it back in the midst of the rest of the coals, and it ignites again and starts to glow with warmth. He said no words, he got up and he left. And you understand what he was saying without words there, that you can't be on fire, you can't be, you're going to go cold as an ember if you come out of the fellowship of believers. The old man came back to church the next week. And I've always remembered that, and I've always thought, you know, someday that'd be fun to do that. And so far, I have never had the ability to go into someone, like, I'll look if I go into that situation, be like, do they have a fireplace? You know? <laughs> Is it winter? Do they have the fire going? Has it been going for a while that there's enough embers? There's a lot of things that have to happen to be able to use that illustration, you see. So usually I don't get to use that. But I can say it like I am now. You don't want to be the person who goes to church because you feel like you need it. You go to church because you've been commanded to go, and there is a reason to go out of faithfulness and love for God, even if you don't feel like you need it that day. Sometimes it helps to, to say, what would I tell somebody else if they came to me and said, well, you know, I just don't feel like going, I don't feel like I need church today. You know, what would you tell that person? Make sure you're telling yourself the same thing you would tell that person. You can and should gather with believers to encourage someone who needs to stand strong against the tide of discouragement, against persecution. We gather to praise God and worship God, to receive from Him instruction from his word we gather to give something to god we gather to encourage one another in our shared faith and the unity that we all share in that faith and the unity we share in god's word we gather for that we gather to bless one another we gather to work together to help one another you you can't live a pious life individually you need that support, and the point here is that you need that support even more as the day draws near. You understand we're, we're much nearer now than at the writing of Hebrews. So the need for that Christian fellowship in church is greater now than it was even then, and it was greatly needed then, you see? Greatly, greatly needed. It's so important that Christians gather together and many times uh, the enemy, our flesh, and many times the enemy, Satan, will, will try and pull that asunder. You're tired. You've had a long week. Uh, you know, you, you'll go next week. Eh, I don't really need this, right? It's different, though, when you have a living, breathing, real, actual church where the spirit is at work and you see it in your own life and you see it in the lives of others. It's a lot harder to say, I'm tired, isn't it? I'm tired. I have weeks where I'm barely dragging myself by. And yet I come out of my love for God and my love for Christ and my desire to serve him. And so it'd be my hope that that is where everybody else grows to as well. And I'm not done growing yet. I'm going to keep growing too. But we don't neglect the gathering together. Saint Saints are meant to be together. Saints are meant to be pluralized. We assemble, uh, worship, worship together, study God's word together, pray together. We assemble, official assembly like this, not forsaking our own assembly. It's a vital part of spiritual life. It is, it is one of the stop gaps that God puts in to prevent apostasy to prevent people from falling away. 
And we do this by encouraging one another, comforting one another, coming up alongside one another, warning one another, strengthening one another. All this much more so as the day approaches, the day of Jesus' return. It draws nearer and nearer. So because of everything we've talked about, we should make an even bigger commitment to being around God's people. And let me tell you, you need that. Like a diver needs an oxygen tank. All it takes is, I bet every single one of you has a story where you were out in the world this week and you saw something, heard something, or went through something that was just sinful. You didn't necessarily do it yourself. You witnessed it, heard about it, read about it, whatever. And you're out in that filth. You're out in this sinful culture that is trying to paw at you and get you to sin and follow your fleshly desires. And you're out in that all week long. You need to come to a place where you will be refreshed, where you will be cleansed by God's word. You'll be reminded of who Christ is and who you are. And you can hit the reset button. You need that. You can only be underwater for so long before you need a breath of fresh air. And it's the same with being out in the world. You can only be out in the world so long before you need to come and be refreshed and take a deep breath of fresh air and be around other believers. Because you need that as we fight against culture, as we stand against culture. You're going to have to have that more and more and more because you're going to run into things that you never dreamed of happening and you don't even know if there's scripture related to it. Guess where you find out? Here. Guess where you get the support to go through that? Here. Where you have other people who are all equal at the foot of the cross but have been given different gifts by God and his Holy Spirit to equip the church and be able to help with what God knew you'd be going through. The eminence or the imminence of the day of Christ's return coming is meant to be regarded as plain yet secret. You're supposed to live as though the day is drawing so near that its arrival is just on the other side of that hill but you don't know which hill. You're supposed to live that way. That's what this is encouraging us to do. So each generation of Christian is called upon to live as the generation in the end time. And so our predecessors as Christians thought they were in the end times. We now think we're in the end times. And maybe we are. But every generation should live like it and should be gathering for that cause. And technically speaking, when you see last days, it can refer to any time from Christ's ascension into heaven to the time of his return. That huge gap can all be referred to as the last days. So it's true to say that we're in the last days, because we are. We might be the generation that's here when Christ comes back. This is an important note. I don't want to rush through the rest of Hebrews 10. So I think I'll end there for today and we'll finish it up next time. Let me just end on this note, though, that I don't think, uh, I've never been one to want to beat people over the head about you need to come to church because you need to come to church. <laughs> like, you should want to come to church. And, and my big belief is, is that if God is really working in you and he is really rightly handling his word here and you're growing in the knowledge and grace of his word and of Jesus Christ, there's something about that, isn't there? When you are, it's like the first time you're ever fed real food. Oh, oh, I need more. Give me more. I'm hearing and I'm reading and I'm seeing things that I didn't before. And now you're addicted in a sense. I need more. I need more. And I think that is, is what happens in, in true churches, that people are drawn not because of uh, multi-level marketing opportunities or because uh, of the entertainment factor, but because they are growing in Christ-likeness. They, see, um, they can see God's Spirit at work within them and within the church. And I think that's true of all good churches. Please pray with me. Father, help us be a good church. Help us be pleasing in your eyes. Please help me to always preach and teach rightly, accurately. Uh, keep us humble. Keep us hungry. Keep us desiring to meet together. Help us, Lord, to 
find our spiritual gifts and put them to use within this congregation and outside of it. Help us to grow in in our own knowledge of your word so that we grow more and more confident in the sharing of your word. Help us to be more confident in our salvation so that we will grow more confident and courageous in the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to remember all these wonderful things that we heard about Jesus tonight in just a few short verses. Help us to remember those things and may they encourage us and strengthen us and and give us a new life, new breath, a new way of, of looking at you with full assurance of our faith, not because of us, but because of you. May you receive all the glory for what you are doing and have done in each and every one of our lives. We thank you for what you're doing and what you will do in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.